Endurance Junkie Podcast, episode 38. Hey Junkie, what's up? I hope you had a very nice weekend. Welcome to another episode of the Endurance Junkie Podcast, the show where I will be interviewing some of the fastest, smartest and most inspiring people active in the endurance world today. Canadian Brent McMahon has spent his career focusing on the ITU style of racing and represented his country at two Olympics. But his transition to 70.3s and Ironman racing is proving to be a good one. He recently did his first Ironman in Arizona and made it a memorable one with a sub 8 hour time and a fabulous win. Brent, thanks for taking the time to chat here today. Now for those of us who don't know you, can you maybe tell us a bit about yourself, your sporting background growing up as a kid, and how you ended up in triathlon? Uh, well, thanks for having me. It's my pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, you know, I've, uh, you know, since uh, I was a kid, I've always been very involved in sports, and my parents always uh, kept me busy because I had a lot of energy as a kid. So, um, you know, I grew up playing all sorts of sports, uh, soccer and water polo and mountain biking. And, um, you know, I did my first triathlon when I was 10 years old and it was, uh, you know, swimming back and forth in the pool and then running around the parking lot and riding around the parking lot. So, um, I've been at it for a long time and, um, you know, just kind of really grown and developed through all different sports of triathlon. And, um, but it wasn't until, um, I graduated high school that I, I did it full time um, through high school. I, I'd play all my other sports, and then in the summer, um, I'd, I'd do triathlon. And um, you know, at the age of 14, I actually uh, first met my coach Lance Watson um, at a triathlon camp in Vancouver. And um, you know, he taught me a lot of things, and you know, kind of got me excited about the sport of triathlon. And you know, so from the age of 14 on, I, I started to do more triathlons. Went to my first world championships in Cancun, Mexico when I was 15 years old. So, um, you know, I sort of started down the high performance path uh, fairly early. And, um, you know, and, and it was interesting that, you know, Lance offered to, to coach me in the summers and, and help me out uh, until I was ready to, to do more or, or move on to another sport. And um, as I got older, I just learned to to love triathlon more and more and just got more and more involved in it. And, um, Lance was there, uh, to help me and, um, guide me along the way. And, um, you know, and so when I, when I graduated high school, I decided to take a year off and, and not go straight into college and, you know, spend, spend a year working and, and training full, full time. So, um, basically since then, uh, I haven't really looked back and, and nor has Lance. Um, you know, I've been working with Lance for 20 years now, and um, we we've kind of gone all, all over the world and all over the the range of, of triathlon. Um, you know, you name it, I've 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 done that type of uh, of triathlon. Yeah. So that's kind of how I I got into the sport and and really developed and became a high performance athlete at it. Yeah, cool. So you're you're basically one of those few athletes that that maybe uh, started purely as as a triathlete as as a kid. Yeah, definitely. You know, like I I, I played lots of sports, but I I just slowly honed my skills as a triathlete. Yeah. Did uh, did your coach see some potential uh, in you at, at a very young age, and, and is that why uh, he, he took you down that uh, high performance route? Yeah, I think definitely that was, you know, that was a, a turning point for him and, and me as well was, was him sort of seeing my, my work ethic and my perseverance. And, you know, I, I wasn't one of those kids that was just, you know, the best track runner at school and, you know, the best swimmer and, you know, had all sorts of talent. Um, I, I think he saw that I just, I had an ability to work really hard and not give up. And, um, you know, initially when I, when I got into multi-sport, I was a better do athlete than I was a triathlete. Um, you know, at the junior world championships in 2000, I was second at duathlon worlds. Um, you know, but in triathlon, I was 12, you know, so, um, you know, so we just knew I, I had to work hard and I think Lance saw that and, and helped guide me where I needed to work hard. 
Oh, cool. I think it's pretty amazing to, to be, you know, at, at 14, 15 years old and have such a, a strong work ethic. You know, I th <laughs> if I look at myself at 14, 15, I, I, was, I wasn't really involved in triathlon yet. I was playing uh, tennis and volleyball at the time, but it was just, you know, I, I, lo I love playing it. And But if, if I would have known now what, what I... Uh, if I would have known then what I know now, and and maybe have that same spirit that you had, you know, there might be a, might have been a possibility to get to, to get to a higher level. So yeah, to, to find that in in a, in a young kid is is pretty amazing. Um, so when did you realize that you were really good at this and that you could do this professionally? Um, you know, I think it. Um, you know, as as a junior, you know, I was able to get on the junior national team and um, started to get an idea of what you know, being on a national team would involve and, you know, the qualifying criteria and, and all of that. And, um, you know, so I think once I graduated high school and, you know, kind of unofficially became an adult, um, I had to, you know, I, I had to make a commitment, you know, my parents wanted me to go to school and they wanted me to get a degree and, and, you know, and, you know, if I wanted to do sport as well at the same time, well then, um, that was fine. And, you know, so I did part-time school for a little bit, but, um, you know, basically when I was 20 years old, I, I sort of had to decide like, you know, I, I, I can't do both. I need to do one or the other. And so at, at that point, I, I really had to decide that, you know what, triathlon is what I want to do and I'm going to do whatever it takes to make it work and make a living from it. And, you know, it's, it's in, it was going to be in the, the Athens Olympic games and, um, it, and it, it had just been in the, the Sydney Olympic games. And, you know, I had the inspiration of Simon Whitfield winning a gold medal. And, you know, so, um, I kind of decided at, at the age of 20 that it was like, that's this is what I want to do, and I'm going to make it work. Yeah. Is it really that that uh, that uh, Olympic race in 2000 that really made you make that decision? I think yeah, I think it was it was um, you know part of of what created the tipping point. Um, I knew I was always going to do triathlon, and um, I just I love the sport and I love the challenge of three sports. Um, but I think you know the the Sydney Olympics just kind of just really stamped that image in my head of, you know, I want to be an Olympian and I want to represent Canada on the world stage. Yeah. Were you in Sydney at that time? No, I was, uh, <laughs> I was actually back. I was back home. I was up at our family cabin at our neighbor's house because at our cabin, we didn't have television. Oh, cool. No, cause I, so I was, I, there, I was there at the race and I saw, I saw him winning from the, from the grandstands. It was a pretty, pretty special moment. Um, wow. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, that was pretty cool. I got some nice pictures of it as well. And I, I sent him it a couple of times and, uh, it didn't reply and uh, hopefully I'll, I'll get him on the show, uh, one day and, uh, and, and talk to yeah. him about it. So yeah, you, you touched on the fact that you were uh, maybe uh, a better Jew athlete at, at the beginning, but then of course you, uh, you definitely made some progress in triathlon and then uh, later on in Xterra as well. Um, you had a pretty solid ITU career, um, culminating in, of course, yeah, representing your country twice, huh? the Athens Olympics 2004 and then again in London in 2012. Um, what has been the highlight of your uh, short course career? Um, yeah, I think definitely um, qualifying for the, the London Olympics was, um, and I say qualifying, not, not the competing, um, because I, I had to go through a pretty epic journey to come back from uh, a year and a half off of racing due to injury. And I had to overcome that, that huge hurdle. And, and I also had, you know, the, the timing of it actually took out, um, three quarters of, or well, I guess about half of the Olympic qualifying period. So not only was I out from racing for a year and a half, I only had half the time to qualify that the other athletes did in order to accrue the points, make the standards and, and qualify for the team. And, um, you know, and so it was, it was the culmination of everybody involved in, in allowing me to do that um, and actually qualifying for the team that um, was just so rewarding because it, it just took so much effort on, you know, my part, but on everybody involved, my, you know, my girlfriend and my parents and all my therapists and all those people. And, you know, so it was just 
so satisfying to to get that done and um you know the the racing at the olympics was you know like no other and and a great experience but it it really is the journey to get there that that stood out for me yeah cool and then uh, yeah you switched to to, to 70.3s uh, after that uh, london olympics was it because you you started feeling a bit too old for the the, the true fast stuff um you know yeah it was uh you know it wasn't necessarily that i was too old it was it was that i was um i was just at the right age um you know lance and i we've worked together for a long time and and he's always said that um when i'm ready i will i will most likely be a better long course athlete than a short course athlete and um you know but he always respected my my dreams and my goals of going to the olympics and You know, after missing the team in 2008 and not being selected to the Canadian Olympic team, um, I had to decide whether that was the time in 2008 to retire from Olympic racing and go into long course racing. And, you know, I, I talked to a, a lot of family and friends and and Lance and, and I decided that I wasn't happy with how that being the end of my career and um so i decided to move on to to london and and go on that journey and um i did some 70.3s back in 2008 and 2009 and won my first 70.3 in new orleans in 2009 and so i definitely saw that i had great potential and that i really enjoyed the the ironman racing um so after london after i'd done everything i could to prepare and be ready and you know compete at my best ability at the olympics i decided that you know what it's i'm i'm 34 um 33 34 that's the perfect time to start learning how to race iron man and and go down that path so that i still have you know a good four to six years of racing the Kona Ironman World Championships. Yeah, cool. Yeah, and I can definitely imagine that if, if that uh, road to qualifying for London was so difficult, that uh, it definitely was a, a good uh, a good moment to turn that page and go and go longer. Um, so, yeah, yeah sure. you, you, you've been working with, with Lance for uh, yeah 14, 14 years, something like that, um, or since you've been 14, so almost 20 since years. 20 years, yeah. Yeah. Um, How has your training evolved over those years, and uh, how has it changed, especially now that you're uh, focusing on the longer stuff? Yeah, it's um, you know, it's been interesting to see the the evolution, and um, you know, both in my training, but then also in Lance's coaching style and um, and the programming, and um, you know, obviously when we were doing the the shorter stuff, there was a lot more intensity. Um, we were doing more interval workouts each week, and um, you know, when I first switch to 70.3 racing there wasn't a huge difference in in volume um we were still doing four hour rides and you know i may still you know i might add maybe a five hour ride where i wouldn't do that for olympic racing um but the change was um mostly in the running where we would do um a lot more volume in sub threshold um so you know instead of doing a lot of high end intervals they were more you know paced strong intervals and you know doing mile repeats or two mile repeats and you know and doing you know anywhere from eight to ten miles of intervals versus you know shorter 800 uh track sessions and 400s and stuff like that So what do you think is difficult to the most difficult to go from the the Olympic distance to 70.3s or stepping up from 70.3s to to Ironman? Um I definitely think going going up the uh you know from the 70.3 to to Ironman. Um you know I think the the training just requires a, a little bit more sort of perseverance and ability to spend a lot of time on your own. Um, there was definitely a, a bigger jump in volume and hours of training uh, in order to prepare for Arizona, and um, you know, and, and you know, seventy point three is just it's kind of double um, an Olympic distance. You know, you, you kind of just have to pace it like that, um, and you can kind of get away with making a few errors, you know, nutrition wise or tactical wise um for for 70.3 but um i think once you step up to iron man it's it's just it's a lot more than two times a half iron man um so much can go wrong and it's such a long day that um you really have to be prepared for you know 
a, a big day and you know and staying mentally motivated and and staying excited about about the race and pushing hard and um you know i think i i was able to prepare really well that way for for arizona yeah no i totally agree with you there i mean i think there's a lot of you know guys making uh itu guys making the switch to to longer stuff and uh they're definitely killing it on the 70.3s but then you see when they do step up to the full iron man that uh yeah some of them make it like yourself and then it's him domin who had a pretty stellar race and uh bevan dogerty when he when he won his couple of races but yeah other guys have, have, have struggled and uh it, it's really not not as easy as um as it seems and and a lot of people think oh once these itus are guys are coming onto the Iron Man, they're, they're going to kill everything, but uh, yeah, it's it's not as easy as that. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, now the the, first, the reason why I'm bringing you on today here mainly is, of course, uh, your stunning debut at uh, at Arizona, and uh, yeah, immediately uh, going sub eight. Um, what were your expectations going into that race? Did you have like a, a race plan, and, and were you able to to stick to it? Um, yeah, you know, I think the, you know, that, that's always the, the beauty of doing your, your first Ironman is, um, you don't have a lot of expectations. Um, everybody, you know, tells you and warns you of how hard it's going to be and, you know, just take it as it comes. And, um, you know, so I think, uh, for me, I, I, I sort of heeded all that, um, advice and, and didn't get too worried about the time that I was going to go and, you know, what I was going to do to go fast or slow or whatever. Um, I really just focused on having a good solid day and making sure I did my nutrition right. And then basically just trying to reduce, um, any errors that I I could make. And, um, really, I just wanted to go out, have a, a good time, enjoy it. And, you know, really just try and put my fitness out on the course and, you know, I didn't know exactly what that would look like. Um, you know, I figured I'd swim at the, at the front and, um, you know, I'd get on the bike and I just wanted to, you know, pace it how I wanted to ride it and, and really ride evenly. Um, you know, and then, and then once I got on the run, I, I knew sort of what pace I could run. Um, but, um, I also, I had no idea because, you know, maybe I would get off the bike and just be totally done and, and not be able to hold that pace that I thought I was capable of. So it was really a, a see, see what comes and, um, just try and stay motivated. Yeah. So the sub eight was never crossing your mind, uh, in, in days leading up to the, to the race. No, you know, and it was funny people, you know, I have asked me, you know, like, so how, how could you not know that, you know, you, the, if you added up what you could do, it would be under eight hours. And I, I just never, I never actually added it together. You know, I actually looked at, okay, I think I can swim a 47 to 49 because that's where other guys have swum. Um, you know, a fast bike time is, you know, 414. I don't think I'm going to ride that well. I figured I'd be in the 420 range. And then, uh, and then the marathon, I was like, you know, I think I can, you know, solidly run a 248. Um, and if it goes better, well, then it'll be faster. And, but I didn't actually add those all together. And, um, you know, and so, you know, basically three miles from the finish, when I was in a world of pain, um, Lance, you know, who it was great to have there, yelled out that, you know, if I kept that pace, I'd be, I'd be going sub eight hours and I don't know what I mumbled, but apparently I mumbled something and waved him off (laughs) because, because all I was thinking about was just keeping my legs going and I can't wait to finish because I was, my quads were so sore and I was just like, I don't care what time I'm going. I don't really care what pace I'm going. I just want to get from here to the finish as quickly as possible because then I'll be done. Is, yeah, is is that what keeps you going at the end of of such a race? Because I, I don't know uh, exactly how much uh, um, you were leading by. I mean, uh, but at at a certain moment, you, you might think, okay, maybe I have a, a couple of minutes uh, in front and, and I can relax. But you sort of have a mindset of I want to get this done as as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think uh, you know that's that's sort of the uh, the approach I I take to to all my races is um, obviously I'm competing against the field and and i'm trying to race 
within the dynamic of the race. And um, but however, what, what, a lot of time when I get onto the run, it's I'm really just focused on what I need to do to run as fast as possible. I'm not I'm not trying to okay, well, how quickly can I catch them or am I dropping them? And, um, you know, I really just focused on my pace and on my effort and on sustaining that, um, that rhythm and that intensity. And, you know, and as, as you go through the marathon, it, it just gets harder and harder and harder. And, you know, everybody told me about, you know, how difficult the last 10 kilometers of it is. And that's when your legs start to tie up and, um, so I was really prepared for that, but then about halfway through, that's when it started for me. That's when my quads started to get really sore. And, um, you know, so I wasn't, I wasn't like worrying too much about, well, are guys catching me or how much of a lead do I have? I was really just, I was just focused on getting my mind over the fact that my quads were just killing me and, and I just wanted to keep the same pace and, that will get me to the finish and if i if i hold this pace that'll get me you know in the win and um so you know it's very focused on on the process of of what you're doing in the moment cool i think you were meant to make your ironman debut a couple of weeks uh prior to that 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 lake tahoe um i think you're already in the water when when the event uh, eventually got cancelled um did you that whole race day preparation did that um, that you had at Lake Tao did that sort of help you here in Arizona to to maybe calm your nerves or uh, something like that yeah you know it was you know um again Lance came with me to to Tahoe and we we got really prepared for that race and got excited about it and um so obviously yeah once once we were getting out of the water from warm up uh to hear that it was canceled was was really disappointing and um you know we we were ready for a, a you know a long day of racing and uh, we didn't get to do that but uh we moved on and and decided on a new plan and that included uh going to Arizona and as well as racing a 70.3 in Augusta and in preparation and um and so yeah as i came to you know get ready for Arizona um you know that that whole beginning part where you're you're prepping all your bags and getting all your gear out which for me you know after doing ITU racing where basically you just need your shoes and your bike and you're good to go um you know counting out all the gels and the calories and the salt and the flasks and you know taping stuff on your bike and you know making all those bags um you know having done that already once before for Tahoe I was actually really calm going into Arizona because it, it actually didn't feel like it was my, my first Ironman prep. I'd already gone through it. And, um, you know, so really race morning, it was like, okay, <laughs> I've done a warm up for an Ironman before I've gotten to the start line. And so I'm ready to go now. And so it really did put my mind at ease, just going, you know, essentially through a dry run of, of preparing for an Ironman. Yeah, cool. So I'm guessing uh, Kona will be the next uh, big goal for 2015. Yeah, you know that was kind of after London. Um, I realized that you know Kona it was was going to be my my main goal, but I wanted to put in a couple of years of racing 70.3 to just you know iron out some details and get some strength, and then um, the plan was to you know start trying to compete at Kona in 2015 and. So we're we're just continuing along that plan, and and obviously uh, we didn't think it was going to start this well, but um, but we're happy with how it went, and um, you know, and now it's just okay. Well, what what can we do training wise to perform better, and um, and racing wise? Yeah. So you obviously earned some some good points here in uh, in Arizona. Uh, what else is on the agenda to uh, secure your uh, Kona slot? I guess you wanted to uh, to secure it as as quickly as possible. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, the ranking system has changed since last year, um, the number of races counting and the types of races. So, um, you know, so it's hard to say exactly what it's going to take to qualify for Kona. Um, you know, we know the it's the top 50 guys ranked, but we don't know whether it's going to be 3,500 points or 4,500 points. So, um, you know, 
hollow, you know, years and years of racing on the Olympic circuit, you're used to, you're used to tallying points and making estimations. So we have a pretty good idea of what we want to do and how many points we want to accrue. And, um, you know, so for me this year, I'm done. Um, it's, it's been a long year and a really good year. So we're just going to go on to a break now and then, um, and then probably start the year with, with doing um, the championship 70.3 events because they, they have the most points. And, um, you know, basically if I can, if I can do well at, um, at the championship 70.3 events and get enough points that we feel comfortable that I'm going to qualify for Kona and I don't have to do another Ironman, then that would, that would be ideal. Cause that means I can, you know, save my legs and, and prepare, um, you know, for Kona, having not done another big Ironman preparation. And, um, you know, obviously this year I was able to race 70.3s all year and then do an Ironman build and race really well. So if we can kind of mimic that next year, then that would be great. Yeah, cool. So what do you think will be uh, your, your biggest challenge if you want to get that Kona win? Um, you know, I think it's, you know, obviously it's, it's very similar to 70.3 worlds when you, when you get all the best in the world in one spot, um, the race dynamic changes, um, you know, you, you're, you're having to play against the other guys and, and be in the right spot at the right time. And then on the run, it's, um, it's very tactical and, and where you allot your, your effort. And, um, you know, I feel like I've, I've learned to adapt to the heat very well. Um, I feel very comfortable racing in, in the, the hot temperatures. Um, I raced Honu this year to get an idea of what the Kona course is like. And I felt I, I raced really well and really strongly. And I've got my hydration and, you know, my salt intake down. And, um, you know, and that took some, took some practice. And I, I definitely had a couple of races where I, I cramped in the last couple of years. And, um, but I think, yeah, managing the heat and managing the, just the, the volume of competition on the course. Yeah. Well, you definitely have a couple of years ahead of you where you can, uh, try to get it right. So yeah, good luck uh, with, with, uh, with that. Um, so you've been, yeah, training and racing as a pro for, uh, yeah, close to 20 years now. Um, and I guess this is all getting in the way of what we, uh, amateurs call a, a normal life. What, what do you see like mm-hmm. the, the biggest, uh, um, how would you say that uh, the biggest sacrifices that you have to uh, have to make as a, as a pro athlete? Um, you know, I think it's, um, you know, yeah, it's not, it's not your normal job, but um, it, it's, it, it is like any other job that, you know, if you apply yourself and you're excited about what you're doing um, it takes time and it takes effort and it takes sacrifice um, whether you're a lawyer or a dentist or, you know, a front desk worker, um, you know, it's, and it's going to take extra hours. And, um, but, um, you know, the, the one thing I, I think, you know, what's, you know, a lot of people they get, but they don't fully understand is that, um, as an athlete, basically everything you do in your life affects your job because, we have to perform, we have to show up to a workout and we have to be prepared to work hard. And so if we hang out too late with friends or you have one beer too many, or if you eat the wrong food, or if you, you know, go on that holiday, um, all those things continually all affect our training, which essentially affects our job, which affects our outcome, which is the race. And so it's, it's always just the balance of, you know, no, trying to have some normal life, which, which is, you know, like everybody wants to have a normal life and, and hang out with their friends and family and be there for weddings and, you know, and, you know, kids being born and, um, all that stuff. And that's, that, you know, makes up life. And, you know, as an athlete, sometimes we have to miss those things and that's, what's really hard. Um, you know, over the years, many of my friends have gotten married and, I've, I've been, you know, racing the same weekend. And so I haven't been able to go to their weddings or, you know, my, my cousins or my brother has his kids and, um, I wasn't able to be there right after. And, um, you know, but that's, that's the sacrifice you make to, to do the job that you love. And, um, you know, and when it's, when it's something you love, then it's easier to, to justify those sacrifices. 
What's been your, your biggest uh, accomplishment so far in, in your career and uh, what has been your biggest disappointment? Um, you know, I think, you know, the biggest accomplishment is, is probably not just, not just one thing. I think for me, it's just being, um, just keeping the longevity in this sport. Um, you know, I've been at it for 20 years and, um, and just finding new ways to be excited about it. And, and, you know, and for me at times that's been switching it up and doing Xterra or doing 70.3 or doing the super sprint races. And, um, you know, I think, you know, it, it, it's hard to be in a, in a career for 20 years and be excited about it the whole time. And, you know, I've definitely had ups and downs, but, um, you know, I think just maintaining excitement is, has been, kind of one of the, the biggest things in my career and um you know and probably the the one of the biggest disappointments would be um you know obviously putting putting four years in and, and not making the, the Olympic team in Beijing and um making a lot of sacrifices and and coming so close um qualifying a spot for Canada but then not actually being able to go um that was a really that was a really hard um point in my life but it was also a turning point in my life because at that moment I had to decide what my my passion and my love um, of the sport was and that I wanted to continue doing it and um, that yeah things don't always go your way and you just have to get up and move on um, so though it was a disappointment it was a, a turning point which you know you, you grow from yeah, definitely try to, to find the, the positive and the negative. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, well, thanks for your, your time, Brent. This has been a really cool chat. How can people uh, get in touch with you? Well, I'm on I'm on Twitter at try Brent McMahon, and then uh, through base, Facebook, Brent McMahon as well. And I also have a blog, uh, brentmcmahon.blogspot.com, which will uh, soon be converting to a website. So. Mm -hmm. All right, great. I will definitely make sure to put those links in, in the show notes that uh, people can access uh, on uh, junkiepodcast.com. Um, feel free to give some uh, some love to your sponsors. Um, well, yeah, obviously, you know, I've been at this a long time and there's there's been a few partners that have worked with me uh, for a very long time and um, probably the longest standing sponsor I've had is Power Bar. Um, I've been with them for over 10 years and um they've just they've been with me no matter what sport i decided to do in triathlon sprints xterra they, they were there for me and and so i really appreciate what they've done and they've supported me along the way oakley has also been there for over 10 years um supporting me and supplying cool stuff uh, to wear and um aquasphere as well um has been one of my major sponsors over the last uh four or five years uh, getting me to races and uh, obviously supplying great equipment for fast swimming. And then uh, sort of sponsors I've worked with in the last couple of years is SRAM and Zip and Quark. Um, you know, they I kind of owe a lot to them for how evenly I rode uh, the Arizona um, Ironman course. I was able to just watch my watts and, and stay within myself. A couple of times I had the opportunity to try and chase guys down and I decided that that was outside of my power range and um, so you know without those tools um, it would have made my race definitely a little more difficult and then um, compressed sport is a new uh, partner that I have that I'm super excited about and same with uh, fusion apparel all right cool anything else you want to plug no that's that's everything you know like Lance is, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's a friend and a coach and, um, you know, I, I think, uh, that's a great partnership as well. All right, cool. Well, I know you have a, a massage to go to, so I will, uh, I'll leave you to that. Thanks very much for your time, Brent. Much appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Hey, well, Junkie, I really hope you enjoyed that episode with Brent as much as I did. We're going to back it up on Wednesday with another interview with a Canadian Ironman winner, Lionel Sanders. And that's definitely another one you cannot miss because Lionel has had a bit of, a, a bit of an alternative path to Ironman success. Um, if you don't want to miss it, the easiest thing will be to go to iTunes and subscribe to the show. And uh, while you're at it, you know, 
um, leave us a rating and a review that will uh, help us grow the show and reach more and more people um, as we as we go along um, as always you can find all the information that was uh, in, in Brent's show links to his uh, to his pages and to his uh, sponsors uh, on the website junkiepodcast.com and uh, yeah you will uh, find Brent's page quite easily there all right We've got uh, Lionel Sanders on Wednesday. I hope to catch you then.